I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to put you on the spot a little bit here, sure. ben, and I hope that's okay because yeah, no, you, I, I you've taught me more the about the ankle. Uh, you've taught me more about the ankle than, than anybody, and it's, a, it's an interesting joint. Uh, and swimming, as you know, is a lot about flexibility, and the ankle turns out to be one of the key joints, not just for the freestyle butterfly and backstroke, where we need to develop this really extreme plantar flexibility, but it's what I call pigeon-toed or inverted plantar flexibility, the ability to not just point like a ballerina, but turn the, the feet in. So as, the, as you're kicking down against the vortex or the slipstream, you get a lot more propulsion with the feet this way, as opposed to straight back. But the question I have is related to the tool that we need for breaststroke, which is just the opposite of butterfly backstroke, and that's pronation. And I'm struggling, and it would, it would be great for the podiatrists listening in to the show who have any dealings with swimming coaches who can tell them, and I've done stretches that I've learned, I can, I can get the plantar flexibility fairly easily with, with ankle stretches, because those ligaments that are, that are fairly small are, are pretty malleable in most, in most swimmers, and especially younger ones, even older ones. But the problem I have is getting more pronation. So how do I get more pronation out of the ankle? Because that is absolutely essential for breaststroke. I have to draw my knees up, internally rotate my hips, and I've got to get those feet pointed straight out in order to capture or to get the surface area to push back with. So is there some exercises that I can use to help pronation? What, what would they be? Yeah. I think the first one, and, and you're attuned to this for sure, is making sure the ankle joint is flexible enough. And you tell me, I, I would think that swimmers develop the calf pretty extensively, not to the degree that soccer players and let's say uh, cyclists would with that overpowering a very big calf relative to the anterior shin muscles. But I still believe that with all the, the plantar flexion kicking and so forth, uh, as you know, and then you mentioned you have dorsiflexion as well, that there is a very strong calf pull that can lead to what we call an equinus from the word equestrian, where the horse's hooves are, are kind of in this downward declinated position that becomes a challenge to overcome. And, and one of the ways that we do not only with exercises of stretching both the gastroc and the soleus and the Achilles tendon is that we sometimes add a night splint or day splint to the mix that can be done at rest so that we're getting, let's say more of a dorsiflexion mm -hmm. angle, more uh, extension in the upward direction on the ankle. Because once that gets limited, that will limit the foot's ability to roll in more if you don't have that available motion uh, ready ready at, at, the, at the waiting. Pronation is really a triplane motion consisting of dorsiflexion, abduction towards the outside, right. and an eversion movement. Mm -hmm. So to yeah. your point about how can we accomplish getting more strength in those areas one of the ways is to just challenge with resistance bands those very movements mm -hmm. so we can put the foot in an attitude of inversion and put a resistance band and or weight ankle weight along the forefoot and then mm -hmm. we have the athlete or patient pronate up against it Mm -hmm. And in that way, they are being challenged beyond just their, their body weight because they have that added resistance, either with a weight or resistance band. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that we do. Another thing that I've learned about lately, and I think this is a real something that you could noodle on a bit and something that I learned from an Australian ski coach as you know, the fascia runs through our entire length of our body. It's not just fascia, you know, in the deltoid, defining the deltoid. There's a thin layer that vests the entire body. 
And because of that relationship, when we look at the front of the ankle and the anterior shin as it goes down into the foot, there's a layer of fascia there that when we wave the toes up, dorsiflex the toes, there is tension that is created. And what that will do is that will bring the ankle forward if we dorsiflex the toes. Mm -hmm. The reason I bring this up is the Australian uh, ski coach, and he was a, actually a demo uh, participant with the Australian ski team. One of the things that he does when skiers are finding themselves in the back seat, which happens when they get tossed around in the moguls, is to have the skiers dorsiflex the toes, which is not something that we're doing in shoes frequently because we don't, we don't think about it. It's a motor mapping phenomena that has to happen with practice, mm -hmm. just like anything else. Uh, I had a ski coach tell me there's no uh, practice makes perfect. There's perfect practice makes perfect movement. So it has to be refined movement and not just gross movement in terms of, you know, just slamming the, uh, the foot forward. One of the ways that we can accentuate those fine motor movements is to use what I sort of call the prehensile big toe to try to keep the foot flat, but only lift up as you're engaged with the floor, the big toe, and then reciprocally, plant the big toe, if we can see it in the, in the picture, I should, probably should have gone the other way here, to plant the big toe while we're engaging the small toes. And if you really get refined, you can plant the big toe and do a reverse play in the piano and go up with two, three, four, and five, which when you try this for the first time is almost impossible because nobody's used to engaging those small intrinsics. We wear shoes, we wear clogs, you know, maybe you would because you're wearing sandals at the pool, pool deck more often engaging those muscles. Mm -hmm. So those are a couple ways to start to engage and work the pronatory forces uh, that you spoke of. Let me ask you a question with, with, with the, on the dorsiflexion because uh, that's interesting that you said to put it into a kind of a dorsiflected hold position with a, with a uh, a splint or some type of uh, fixed static stretch, basically, right? No, for a long period of time. Especially when you don't have the available motion. That's a, that's yeah. a uh, problem solution. Uh, when, I, when I was at Indiana, Doc, you, you made me a pair of, you call them alligator shoes. They were converse high tops. He nailed onto an incline of about 45 degrees. And, you know, and then on pieces of wood, I would be walking around the dormitory with my toes pointed up in the air to try to stretch. Oh, I would have my... loved to have seen that. If, if you, that could be in the, the, uh, the swimming hall of fame at Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to tell you that it turned me into a great press circuit, but unfortunately it didn't. It didn't. <laughs> so I, I don't know, I can't testi testify to the success of that particular apparatus. Uh, however, and that could have been because I didn't, I hated wearing them and I didn't wear them enough, but it, it, it was a dynamic stretch. I was, you know, obviously not stretching all the time, but it, as you walk and you move the, the leg forward, you put more stretch on it. There's, although you're always stretching to some degree. So it, it kind of begged the question is, is, I mean, I've seen the incline boards where you put your, your foot up there and you kind of step into it and dynamically stretch. And I, I always think that that Achilles tendon is like stretching the transatlantic cable, you know, it's so big and it's so strong. And then you've got that big gastro muscle, you know, is it better to stretch it dynamically or is it better to hold it and just keep you know, stretching it like you suggested? So, so the, the answer is, is both because, you know, as you know, the, the muscle has the eccentric and concentric phases, the stabilization phases, and then the, the, the dynamic contractile. And what, what is being talked about a lot, particularly in the track world, and I imagine it'll uh, mirror, you know, sift its way down to the swim world, is this idea to not just think about eccentric and concentric um, phases as two independent phases, but almost as a continuum. 
because there's still things that are crossing over during those phasic activities. Obviously there's the reciprocal muscles, but stabilization um, has its elements of dynamic uh, portions to it mm -hmm. without getting too much into the weeds in the, in the context of this interview. But um, so I think that there's a more fluid look at how we're looking at concentric and eccentric uh, training phases. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to suggest to my athletes then to do both, but I also am going to try because I've never done this before. And I think that's an interesting concept to put the elastic band again to try to increase the eversion of the foot. But I also like your suggestion for abducting the foot with elevating the outer toes, you know, in a, in a you know, you know, like an exercise, pressing the first metatarsal down and lifting the outer side of the foot. Those are all uh, fascinating because I don't know that anybody's ever tried that. I mean, in, in swimming coaches, and unfortunately I, I'm not among them proudly, that they look at an athlete and says, you know, breaststroke gets, with women, it's 80% of the velocity is being contributed from the kick. So it's a very kick dependent stroke and without a kick and breaststroke, you don't have much going for you. And, and, and coaches tend to look at a swimmer and say, okay, you can kick breaststroke, you're a breaststroke, or you're not a breaststroker, because you can't. But how do we change that? How do we take the non-breaststroker and can we turn them into a breaststroke? And it really is two joints. It's, it's that ankle, which, you know, you've really enlightened me. Um, thank you for how we change that. I don't know how changeable it is. I don't know how much abduction, additional abduction we can get, or how much additional aversion we can get. I do think we can definitely get more dorsiflexion with time and effort. And then the hip, the hip is also a very stubborn, big joint that doesn't, you know, the internal rotation of that hip, I think is key. key. And, and I don't know which one, I think they're both equally important in the restaurant. I've said, I've had some athletes who didn't have much internal rotation, but still had good kick because they had great pronation ability. And I've had others that had amazing internal rotation, but didn't have such good pronation who could also kick. I think they probably are both important in, in being able to get that angle. And, and we fight for degrees, Ben. I mean, it, you think about the dynamics of swimming, but when you're trying to increase drag and you make one or two degrees of increased you know, angle, all of a sudden the drag forces go up tremendously. So I call swimming the sport of degrees, millimeters, and hundreds of seconds in timing. You know, to make it to make it work. 